Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it, it, it just goes sort of far for the course when you start getting, you know, so things set up that seems to behave properly. And as soon as you're ready to sort of go live, it, it gets a little strange. So, uh, well, welcome, everyone. It's an, it's an honor, uh, Gal, and a privilege, uh, Paula and Christina, to be here and have an opportunity to uh, talk with you folks this morning. Um, a little bit uh, disconcerting for me. I'm not able to see any uh, of your cameras. I, I can only see my slides. Uh, you unfortunately have to look at me, so I apologize for that. Um, I could have a, should have a lovely background or something else that you could see, but um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I, I had a, a question sort of to ask, um, and of course, yeah, my slides are not advancing now. Oh, there we go. I, I do have to thank uh, some Dear colleagues at the University of Oklahoma, primarily Dr. Jane Solovsky, Mark uh, Chaffin, who in, is deceased now, uh, Barbara Bonner, along with the staff of the National Center on the Sexual Behavior of Youth at the uh, Center on Child Abuse and Neglect at the University of Oklahoma for permission to use some of the slide contact and for years of collaboration and the opportunity to learn from them uh, the model for treatment for children with problematic sexual behavior. So first thing um, I wanna, wanna ask, how many of you have worked in some capacity with issues of children who have had problematic or other sexual behavior problems, teens or children? So I'm going to ask you just to raise your hands if you can on your uh, platform here. And then um, I can see some of those things popping in. I can't tell uh, the number of folks. So um, we're seeing a number. Of, I see a number of uh, clicks going up there that eight or nine folks have, have indicated you have some background with it. Uh, so if you're, if you're working with children who've had these behaviors, then de facto you're working with parents, or you should be, and should be closely working with them. Um, we encounter this in a number of circumstances, biological families, children in foster care, children in congregate care, uh, all kinds of situations. And unfortunately, the reaction is often that, oh my gosh, kind of panic reaction. And we're really trying to encourage folks not to panic about this behavior. It's certainly concerning. Uh, and it's certainly something we want to interrupt and, and prevent happening uh, because of the impacts and consequences. But, you know, if we think about the reaction that people often have to children who exhibit problematic sexual behavior, um, there's a high rate of reactivity and anxiety around that behavior. Again, as it should be, this can be very disruptive um, to uh, those who are sort of on the receiving end of these behaviors. But if you think about children who are aggressive, who are fighting on the playground and punching other kids in the nose on a regular basis, we have a different sort of frame that we kind of put that in. We often don't have that same reactivity to it. We have a little bit of the boys will be boys that will happen sometimes. So we want to start out with a frame of let's not panic about this. This is one of a range of behaviors that children may use. I'm going to ask you to identify in the chat box, if you would, what terms that you have used or heard others use when referring to youth who exhibit problem sexual behaviors. And maybe even think for a moment if you feel like there's some differences in the terms or if those terms change when we're talking about say teens versus younger children and if so why. So, what, so uh, Gal or Christina if you could read me if there are any comments in the chat about some of the comments that or terms that people may hear used for this population. So we, we have um, perpetrators, sexual perps, mini pedophile, sick, sexually inappropriate, groomers, predatory, deviant, difficult. That's a pretty robust list. Those are yeah. common ones that we hear. For a moment, if any of you have children, or even if you don't have your own children, think of a, a nephew, cousin, you know, someone that you're close to, and imagine that label being applied to that child, mini perp, predator, uh, those kinds of things. We, we cast them in a really negative language, and, uh, and that begins to influence both the way that we treat these children, but also the way that they see themselves. We don't to call children who get into aggressive fights in the classroom and punch other children, we don't call them batterers, but we call these children many perpetrators, predators, et cetera. So our, our view and our stigma and our bias around this is, is significant uh, in terms of the impact. But why is this information important? Um, um, we're gonna focus in this presentation on uh, referring to problematic sexual behavior for youth 12 and under. If we were gonna be talking about teens, that would probably be a separate presentation. 
Um, about 6% of kids presenting with mental health for mental health treatment will display some level of problematic sexual behavior. That data is a little bit old, but hasn't been actively replicated in any recent years and um, very frequently, but those numbers hold true. Uh, to be about the same. It's also important that if you look at the ACE study information or from the information from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, about 25%, about one fourth of all youth in the US and probably worldwide will experience at least one traumatic e event before they turn 18. And the intersection of those two things is really important. Um, many youth as a result of these exposures to trauma can have a range of disruptive behaviors, internalized and externalized behaviors, everything from anxiety and depression and self-loathing and all kinds of things to a range of external behavior, inability to concentrate, trouble remembering things, uh, intrusive recollections, and problematic behaviors. Aggression uh, and uh, sexual aggression can be part of that. So some children who exhibit problematic sexual behavior, but not all, um, are the result of the traumatic stressors that they experienced in the past. And they don't necessarily have to be reactions to sexual abuse. We'll talk about that more in a moment. It can also be a reaction to other traumas. So uh, I say all that because it's really important to recognize the trauma-related factors uh, because they're really critical to how we view the behavior that may be happening, and especially in terms of how it would need to be treated. Um, and understand the influence of reminders. Those reminders may not necessarily be of a sexual experience early on. In fact, uh, most of the time they are not. Uh, it may have been a distress uh, and this behavior has become exhibited because it helps the child calm or self-soothe. Um, uh, it may be uh, an attempt to uh, gain int intimacy other kinds of things. So we want to talk about just sort of briefly about typical sexual development and then talk about, well, what makes problem sexual behavior, problem sexual development sort of different. So typical sexual development is part of overall human development. It's very healthy. It involves curiosity and curiosity about the world in every way, including how our bodies work and how they look and how they're different gender to gender. So it's how children learn about the, word, or the world. Um, language plays a role here. Probably anyone, if you've been around younger children, um, you know how fond they are of language that's a little risque uh, as they get into um, maybe uh, early school years and even middle school years, particularly jokes and humor around pee and poop and fart and all of that is like right in their wheelhouse. It's the stuff that it seems a little risque and um, it makes you look perhaps more mature to your peers when you're doing that. But you know, it, it really doesn't stop with little kids. Um, if anyone's ever watched a Seth Rogen movie, you know that this kind of interest and this kind of humor doesn't stop for males until they're in their 30s. Heck, uh, if you buy a, um, a Tesla, one of the earlier models of the Tesla electric sports car has a fart button on the dashboard that you can push to amuse, I guess, yourself or everyone in the back seat. And that's, you know, a, a, uh, a very expensive sports car. So the interest and the fascination around this stuff really doesn't stop uh, very early on. There's also a mimicking kind of behavior. Children are amazingly good and are supposed to be good at mimicking adult behavior. Sometimes they mimic that behavior in places where they shouldn't, or they shouldn't have been exposed to it in the first place. So sometimes the behavior that children exhibit is just simply what they've seen. And typically, for children doing exploratory sort of behavior in their early sexual development, it's, it's uh, usually by consensual agreement. It's a, I'll show you yours if you'll show me mine kind of thing here. So children have that natural curiosity, as you can see in the, the image here of a little boy in the store peeking up underneath the blouse to see, you know, does this person look like mommy? And in fact, they don't because clearly on that model, the nipple is missing. So you will hear a few terms from me that you may not hear in some of the other presentations because of the topic that we're talking about. I don't know if you can read the little joke there, a little boy saying, okay, we took off our clothes, I got on top of you. Uh, how long till this starts feeling good? She's, I don't know, but I've got a headache already. Um, children are very literal about things. And again, what they mimic may not be, you know, exactly uh, what they saw. Um, so typical sexual behaviors for children involve parts of the body considered private or sexual. So the ones mentioned there, and it's, again, normal part of growing up and development, which most professionals would not see as problematic or harmful in any way. Of course, there are a lot of frames for culture and social factors that are put around that, the individual culture of the family, but of course, what's appropriate and okay and not okay in larger cultures. Probably everyone has grown up with the knowledge of the stereotype of, say, Italian men pinching, you know, young women and, uh, you know, as a sign of sort of 
um, whatever, um, you know, infatuated by their beauty or whatever, but it's highly appropriate, clearly. But it's been the butt of many jokes worldwide. So there are cultural stereotypes, but there are also cultural norms and social factors that really play a role here. So it depends on the type of behavior, the frequency, et cetera. Um, but this behavior uh, is very common in children. 42 to 73 percent of children, at least in U.S. studies, have exhibited some uh, typical sexual behavior by the time they're age 13. So typical sexual play um, is in that same vein. It's exploratory. It's spontaneous. Rarely do children uh, at a younger age when they're showing uh, behavioral issues around uh, um, sexual curiosity, etc., um, are they premeditated or planned in any way? They're usually very opportunistic. Typically by mutual agreement, again, there's a curiosity, a mutual curiosity that takes place. And it's more often with children of similar ages or similar developmental level or size. And it is not accompanied by coercion, anxiety, fear, anger. And pretty much if you've got a problem sexual behavior, it's going to be the opposite of the things on this list. So, we're not talking about adolescence, but it's sort of uh, probably appropriate to talk about what typical adolescent sexual behavior is just for just a moment. Um, and this runs the gamut for teens. Every, anything from highly naive to highly sexualized would be considered pretty normative for teens. Um, the numbers for exposure or sexual initiation are coming down uh, uh, per generation, it seems. About 48% of US high school students have had intercourse. 35% say that they are regularly sexually active. So that's a pretty high number. Typically speaking, uh, especially preteen years, girls tend to be more sexually aggressive than boys. They also, of course, grow at a, a faster rate. They tend to be taller, more developed, that sort of thing. And unfortunately, while there's increased information, a great deal of information available about sexual health and all of those kind of things, huge myths, particularly for teens, still prevail. Um, there's a link here if you're interested in some interesting myths that prevail. One of them, for example, is that if you drink Mountain Dew after intercourse, then you won't get pregnant. So believe it or not, some of those things still prevail out there. So uh, it's important that education kind of underscores everything. We have to understand there's a natural curiosity for children. And unfortunately, sometimes adult behaviors um, set that off kilter uh, from what it should be. So if you look at the picture in the upper screen, you know, um, you know, <laughs> this is a little boy who's curious and, and here's this interesting thing he doesn't usually see. You know, depending on the venue that we're in, we as a culture, in most cultures, really uh, extol curiosity. We want children to be interested in STEM uh, training and that kind of thing. We, we uh, reward curiosity. We have some examples here, the Curious Boys Adventures, um, questions and curiosity for inspired kids. We even have in the U.S., uh, some of you um, internationally may not recognize the little guy in the upper right-hand corner, but that's Curious George. We have a whole series of books for children about all the, the shenanigans that Curious George gets into because of his curiosity. I might invite you, what comes to your mind when you see the picture in the bottom-hand corner of the screen? What's going on with those boys? Now, you might imagine maybe they're peeking into the girl's shower. And what would you think about those guys if that's what they were doing? But what if I told you they were trying to peek in to see the World Cup soccer match? Would that change your opinion of the Curious Boys? So we have to think about the cultural frame we put things in for our children. Sometimes we set them up for issues and then blame them for the behavior that happens as a result of that. So think of sexual development as part of overall development and how children develop relationships, how they develop in their communication skills, what they learn about nurturance and intimacy. Those are all challenging things for children to learn and manage and socially appropriately navigate. This should be no different than any of those kinds of things. Some children, of course, need a lot of extra support. Some children need support in helping to develop healthy and appropriate relationships or communication skills or learn how to accept or receive appropriately nur appropriate nurturance. In just the same way, children need skills and support to be able to manage their sexual development. And unfortunately, that part is often lacking, often because parents are less comfortable about that um, and don't know exactly how to approach it. So this, is, this doesn't mean when children exhibit these behaviors that they're deviant, they're perpetrators, they're bad, or they're damaged in some way. It's part of typical sexual and human development. So to see it in that frame, is a much more helpful place to put it.
So what then are problematic sexual behaviors? So again, we're talking about children under 12, uh, 12 and under here for the most part. So again, I mentioned earlier, they're exploring these sexual body parts, but we're, this is behavior that we're considering developmentally inappropriate or potentially harmful to either the child that's doing it or the person who's on the receiving end. Again, usually another child. But it's important to remember that the intentions and motivations for children who exhibit problematic sexual behavior may or may not be related to sexual gratification or sexual stimulation. And typically it's not at all that for younger children. It may be about intimacy. It may be about how they're using their power in a relationship with someone else. It's very unrelated to curiosity, how they're managing their anxiety, if they're imitating behavior that they've seen, if they're doing it to calm themselves or to draw attention, maybe draw attention in an outrageous way to get people to focus on them as sort of the bad boy or the bad girl, um, or maybe they're very awkward attempt at intimacy or connection or for a host of other reasons. So let's see this on a continuum running from normal to concerning behaviors to the ones that then we would just generally consider, consider as problematic. It's important though to put a pin in the role of toxic or traumatic stress that may happen for children. Um, because youth are in formative developmental years. It's so important to understand the context of any sexual behaviors that occur before deciding how to respond. Um, are the behaviors part of typical sexual development? Or could they be seen in the context of maybe a child who has an intellectual, uh, cognitive, or other kind of disability? Uh, often there's a higher uh, incidence for youth who have uh, intellectual disabilities. Have the behaviors developed as a way to help the child calm themselves, soothe themselves under distress or when they're tense? Um, often we see these behaviors as reenacted enactments of things that they viewed, either adult sexual content, you know, in movies, videos, those kinds of things, exposure to those graphic sexual images, um, or they've seen that behavior demonstrated in front of them by adults, um, or it's been reenactment of play that they've been involved in, or unfortunately also reenactment sometimes of the sexual abuse that they themselves have experienced. So let's look at sort of uh, some factors that play a role in the development of problematic sexual behaviors. There are individual vulnerabilities for the child. So for children who tend to have greater behavior problems, um, have co-occurring diagnoses such as attention deficit disorder, um, disruptive behaviors, uh, oppositional defiant, those kinds of things. We see a higher percentage of these behaviors with those youth. Children with impulse control issues, so back to those externalized behaviors, which may be due to an underlying mental health problem, may be due to exposure to trauma. We also see a high percentage of these behaviors in families where there's a lot of adversity. Factors that interfere with the parents being able to be consistent uh, supervisors, consistent disciplinarians, uh, children who are exposed to adult substance use, um, uh, adult behaviors while under uh, the influence of various substances, um, problems with general supervision, problems understanding natural development for children uh, and how to nurture and support that. So those are huge factors. Um, another big piece are where children have been exposed to some form of violence. So they're modeling coercive patterns of interaction whether it be physical abuse, interpartner violence, community violence, or they've been exposed to um, persistent, uh, harsh parenting practices. Those are other highly correlated factors. And then of course, um, what they've been exposed to in terms of sexuality, whether they've experienced sexual abuse or they're modeling things that they've seen. The intersection of all of those pieces really creates a perfect storm for the probability of a child having problematic sexual behavior. And of all of those four, the one that would probably rise to the top of the heap would be the exposure to sexual content and certainly their own sexual abuse uh, is, a, is a highly correlated factor. So look quickly at these images here. I just swiped a couple of quick pictures off the internet here. Who has the behavior problem here? Is it the child or the adults that are creating a permissive environment and encouraging and maybe even goading children on? We've all heard uh, caregivers, adults, uh, laughing at something a child has said that's sort of beyond their years. Um, they, they pop out with a phrase that's really kind of an adult phrase. And if it's not inappropriate, they're gonna get laughter. They're gonna get a lot of adult attention for that. Many children, unfortunately, receive um, confusing messages from adults. Um, 
and not know that what they're doing is not okay, or maybe permitted in their home to have certain behaviors, touching or use of certain words or other kinds of behaviors. But when they do those behaviors in a public place, it's not gonna be okay. They're certainly around other, other communities um, and situations. So children often don't understand those parameters for them. So some guidelines in determining if the sexual behaviors are a problem are these main categories. How frequent are they? How does this match up with the development and what's coming as a result of things? So higher the frequency, greater concern. So um, if it's beyond typical child uh, activities, behaviors that a child might know about, especially if it's indicative that the child is replicating adult sexual behavior. So for example, think about younger children typically would not conceptualize that a mouth could be put on a genital part. Typically for children, it's like, ooh, no. But if a child's been exposed to that, they, they may frequently uh, demonstrate or certainly have curiosity about that behavior. Another concerning thing would be if the behavior is unresponsive to the parent's typical responses to um, intervene or to stop the behavior. Cautioning, um, timeouts, uh, consequences, uh, explanations, etc. If the behavior is persisting, you know, that would be a concerning uh, aspect of this. And then developmental considerations. Um, is it occurring between children of a larger age difference? So particularly we look at age difference of about four years. If there's an age range of a child that's four years older than the child that's receiving the behavior, that's another red flag. Uh, developmentally, that's out of line. If the behaviors are longer in duration, then we would expect if the child begins to, to exhibit some uh, compulsivity or impulsivity around those behaviors to make them replicated, that's a red flag. And certainly if it's interfering with their social development. Um, it's not uncommon for young children to be to occasionally touch their private parts, um, especially at home. Um, but if they're doing that while you're shopping at the mall or you're in the grocery store and that's not stopping uh, based on the typical adult responses to limit that behavior, you know, that, then it needs a little bit more intervention. And certainly if the behaviors are coming to harm, they're intrusive to other people, they're uh, creating consequences in their own experience or they're occupying so much of their time that it's an intruding with their daily functioning. If it ever includes force, intimidation, intimidation, use of power, coercion, it's definitely in the red flag category, especially if it's eliciting fear and anxiety in the other children. We really crossed over significantly the problematic. I'm not going to go through this slide in great detail, but it, it's important to at least mention here uh, the role of media exposure in problematic sexual behavior. Youth spend an enormous amount of time in front of media, and it's a really concerning level of exposure. Um, most of that doesn't occur with adult supervision. So if you think about the time we're in now, where children are now online in order to do homework and keep up with things, um, and frequently they're not supervised during this, they may even have accidental exposures to content they may be being sought out by people who have predatory intentions online, uh, contacted in chat rooms and in other ways. Um, so this is a very concerning area. It's like having an unlocked weapons cabinet in your home. If you have unsupervised um, internet access for children, particularly younger children, because there are people who purposely uh, uh, intend to attract them, groom them, et cetera, online, or just expose them to information. So there's a great deal of frequency of exposure. It's a note to say that 76% of teens have said that TV and movies made sex, certain sexual activities seem normal for teens. And it's estimated that 40 to 90% of young males and females, 18 and under, have been exposed to graphic sexual images, much of it considered deviant, fetishistic, or hardcore. So um, there's a high level of exposure here. This is a concerning time that we're in when families are isolated at home and not getting out. This exposure um, is really an issue. A lot of parents don't understand, for example, that the platform that the child may be using may be able to access the internet even though it's only a video game platform. If a child is on headphones, a parent should typically at some point check in, what are you listening to and can I hear it? And if they're reluctant to let you hear it, then maybe they shouldn't be listening to it in the first place, or they may be commuting with someone uh, over a video game platform. And a lot of adults, again, don't understand that those systems can, in many circumstances, hook up to the internet. So how are they communicating? What are the modalities? They're all the ones that we're familiar with here, but it's also to be, uh, taken into consideration that children need a lot of edu education around the consequences of either ex uh, observing or certainly if they are 
um, retweeting or if they're, they're uh, texting or emailing graphic sexual images, whether they're adult sexual images or youth produced images. And while consequences may be a little bit different around that, um, law enforcement does monitor these things. Children often don't understand that these uh, images live on the internet really you know, uh, indefinitely. Um, they may say, send an image of themselves or receive an image for someone else and then uh, tweet that back out again or email that back again and in doing so actually commit a crime. So um, children need education around this. Uh, and there's a lot of management issues around this. This should be and can be a whole topic in and of itself because uh, it is so epidemic and the consequences for exposure to sexual images online for youth are, are really problematic and the data is mounting on that. So a couple of brief facts about children who exhibit problematic sexual behaviors. We're going to talk, spend the rest of our uh, few minutes here before we open for questions talking about how to manage this. Most youth who exhibit problematic sexual behaviors, it's important to know, have not been sexually abused. In fact, less than half have, usually between a third and a half, have histories of sexual abuse. But they have a range of other factors, particularly exposure to violence, that can, is highly correlated uh, with this behavior. And it's also successfully treated in outpatient treatment for the most part. Most kids can and should attend regular school, even if they've exhibit, exhibited sexual behavior problems. They need that structure. They need that normal socialization. Of course, they need a lot of supports to make that successful. Caregiver involvement is crucial. Very few kids, if they receive treatment, even if it's not a complete treatment, the data has shown they will have very few ongoing sexual behavior problems. In fact, the recidivism rate for children with problem sexual behaviors of having a future problematic sexual behavior is less than 3%. That's an enormously successful rate. The likelihood if they get in trouble with something else is it's going to be some other delinquent spectra behavior, you know, breaking into a car or stealing something, that kind of thing. Kids who have shown problem sexual behavior uh, do not grow up to be adult sexual offenders. It's really, really important to, to have. Think about that from a logical point of view. If, be, if being sexually abused m turned you into a sexual offender, the world would be populated by female sexual offenders because predominantly the victims of sexual abuse are women. And it's, and it's not. So it's, it's not that simple connection. The rates of youth who were sexually abused as, as children who grew up, to, grew up to be sexual offenders is actually very, very, very low. Most were not victims of sexual abuse. They were usually victims of violence and particularly exposure to inner partner and family violence. So um, those are important considerations to, to, to have. And it often can be information that will allay a lot of fears for caregivers. I do want to make a quick note about treatment findings. Uh, a wonderful meta-analysis study that was done back in 2008, and some of the participants in that study were the folks at the University of Oklahoma's Center of Child Abuse and Neglect. They did a meta-analysis of the treatment programs out there for children with problematic sexual behavior. And the strongest predictor of improved outcomes was uh, the introduction and uh, consistency with um, parenting behavioral strategies to address the problem. So behavior parent training, um, which included rules about sexual behaviors and boundaries, abuse prevention, uh, sexual health education, all of that was highly successful in a cognitive behavioral therapy frame. What didn't work is when they tried to take adult offender type models and slam them, dunk them on youth. It's shown to have no uh, benefit, um, in fact, some ways harmful. So supervising these youth, it all starts with communication, having that conversation with kids and everyone in the family around privacy rules, or how you get to the bedroom or the bathroom, making sure you knock before you enter. You're always closed when you're leaving uh, one room or another, moving about the house. We should talk about what the private parts rule are, rules, rules are in the house. Rules about any physical contact, tickling, roughhousing, hitting, et cetera. Personal care only done in private. Um, washing, bathing, being in the bathroom, everyone again is closed as, as they're exiting, clothed, excuse me, as they're exiting. Clarify, particularly for children who have exhibited any kind of problematic sleep, uh, behaviors, they're not sleeping or napping in the same room at all, if at all possible with other children. Uh, adults approve and know what's being watched on TV, know about the video games, know about on online activities and are checking those regularly. And again, that's really a challenging uh, uh, issue right now with uh, family sheltering at home. 
So we need to be able to explain to children when they're together. If you have a youth who's exhibiting problematic sexual behaviors or has at any point, that you need to be able to see them at all times, know where they are. So basic um, parent behavioral training is going to be really, really uh, important to kind of drill down on. And it is the hardest piece because parents uh, lack consistently consistency and need a lot of training themselves to be able to manage this. So all the things that we just mentioned, rules about sexual contact, education about sexual health, uh, skills for abuse prevention. If something has already happened in the family, then that needs to be directly hit head on and talked about very openly. For children, they need to learn skills for impulse control, be able, a, being able to label and express their feelings so they can use words instead of behaviors. Um, skills to calm themselves and reduce distress so they don't turn to something else like self-touching or someone else. Uh, social skills, problem solving skills, and then family factors. The whole family needs to be involved if there's been an exhibition of a problematic sexual behavior by any of the youth. Not that it blows up to the point where everyone knows everyone else's business and there's no privacy, but that the family is involved. Just as if, you know, someone in the family, uh, God forbid, had the COVID virus. The whole family would respond to safety and protection around that. And it's a, it's a, a workable uh, analogy, I think. You know, and it needs to be developmentally at a level that children can understand. So the conversation with the younger children is different than the middle school age than it is from the high school student. But it all needs to have an open conversation. And in some cases, um, for children who have exhibited behavior to other family members or, or uh, uh, anyone outside the family, apologies and, and learning to extend empathy to their victims when they're old enough to understand that connection may be valuable, not in every circumstance, but that may be valuable. So some other things about prevention, um, again, maintaining rules, not in a, in a really um, uh, authoritarian way necessarily, but in a clear matter of fact way, teaching and maintaining rules, respecting privacy, respecting modesty, uh, encouraging safe uh, displays of affection. So among children who have exhibited problematic sexual behaviors, um, they need to still be able to exchange affection, but maybe the side hug now versus a full front hug because that may be too stimulating for one of the children. Um, monitoring uh, their environment, both at school, of course we're out of school right now, but we will be back, home, around the community, in front of media and on the internet. Those are all crucial pieces of keeping a sort of a safety observation plan in place. Um, the right side of the page lists some of the other family related kinds of things using skills for redirection or distracting if children tend to be focused on these behaviors. Some children um, need uh, activities to redirect their energy in some good and helpful way. Um, many of our you know, parents and grandparents, you know, had the phrase idle hands are and probably the rest of you can answer that, you know, the devil's workshop. Um, so many of our children out of boredom and those kinds of things um, may exhibit some of these behaviors. So we have to help them use up their energy, um, teach about things to avoid, don't set themselves up on a slippery slope. For younger children, they need to be reminded, cued in advance of using skills and things that they need to do to keep themselves and others safe. So it's a constant vigilance. Um, if, if a caregiver is needing to rely on other supervisors, and particularly at this time when children in our home typically 24 7 you, the caregiver may have to widen their circle of people that they talk to and bring into uh, helping with supervision maybe other trusted family members or someone else and that's a dilemma because sometimes when caregivers let someone else know about this then they get shunned uh, or they're blamed uh, for the problem uh, there's embarrassment there are a lot of issues for families around this so Challenging times for supervising youth who have problem sexual behavior are really typically any times of transition where adult supervision may drop. So think about, you know, starting and stopping bedtime, uh, bathing times, uh, when children are together, uh, multiple children are together, you've got one caregiver trying to observe, or you're outside the home trying to manage multiple children. It's a surveillance issue for caregivers, and it can be really, really a challenge to manage space. If you're in a small home, how do you divide up and conquer so that kids can have their own space, they're not really on top of each other, but they're also not in a situation where they're out of uh, visible sight of the caregiver. Um, I actually was on a consultation call the other day for trauma-focused CBT, and one of our clinicians had a family that was struggling with that. 
And the parent uh, uh, had a grandparent, uh, the, the mom's mom, who was uh, in another part of the city and was regularly uh, Skyping in and, and communicating with the children remotely. And mom frequently would have to do chores or go to the bathroom herself. So she would actually have mom monitor the children online while she ran some errands around the house, did some other things and had, you know, took care of her personal needs to know that someone else could, okay, so-and-so left the room. Um, need to report back to mom that, you know, are they okay? Where did they go? So there are creative ways to, to do that. Um, this slide just kind of talk, talks about some general rules for supervising children at home um, and being mindful that, um, you know, opportunity, curiosity, overstimulation, those can be the slippery slopes, whoops, excuse me, slippery slopes to those behaviors um, being, a, being a problem. I think I just hit my keyboard here. Um, Sorry about that. Um, so making sure the private parts rules, particularly for younger children, are identified and reviewed regularly. I'll show you a slide about those in a moment, making sure there's always supervision and preventing those opportunities, again, during those uh, unsupervised times, but also helping children to have meaningful, enjoyable activities that do keep them occupied, whether it's music or games or school activities, art activities. And it's really important for children that adults get involved in those things, not just hand a child a task and expect them to be able to self-manage that or stay focused for very, <clears throat> excuse me, very long. Care if more caregivers involved, the more children are going to enjoy that and the more they're going to be able to do that for an extended period of time. So teaching about any unwanted touching behavior, even a hug or a tickle, there needs to be rules about if a person says no or stop, I don't like that, it needs to stop. Everybody, including the grown-up has to follow those rules and adults as well have to model those rules. So here's an example of teaching private parts rules for younger children. There's no touching of other people's private parts. Uh, and, and be specific, children need you to spell out that you mean kicking, hitting, pinching, biting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that no showing private parts to other people. Uh, keep your clothes on when other people can see you. No looking at other people's private parts. Uh, touching your own private parts when you're alone is okay, or no touching private parts in public. And it's not okay to use sexual words or actions if they're going to make someone else feel uncomfortable. Um, so if a caregiver were to, re to uh, walk in on or identify a problem behavior, um, there's some ideas here about approaching that. It's usually more helpful to use words that describe the behavior and not for the child to feel that they are bad or they're nasty or there's something wrong with them. So focus on the behavior and think of it about as teaching versus punishing. It's really important for caregivers, even if this has been repeated behavior, it can be very frustrating. Uh, there can be a lot of anger and frustration on the caregiver part, especially if the child continues to violate some of those rules or push the limits on those rules. Important to stay calm, you know, maybe even step back for a moment, take a deep breath before responding uh, to be able to manage that interaction better. Be firm, set limits, keep voice tone neutral, but not, you know, and not threatening and not uh, blaming or shaming of the child. Um, help them to know that you're there for support, but they should need to know that you're serious about the rules and about the boundaries because um, children will often take the cure, cue from you. So stop the behavior um, and manage that situation to change it in the moment if you can. Uh, stop, distract them or move them directly out of the environment. Maybe move the child's hand away, move their body away, separate children firmly and calmly. Stop what you're doing you know, get dressed, come with me to the other room, whatever the direction needs to be. And clearly in as few words as possible, because adults kind of like I'm doing now, tend to talk too much. Um, describe the behavior that's, that's needing to be stopped. Maybe getting the child's eye level, maybe gentle touch on the shoulder, make sure they're focusing and they're getting, giving you their full attention. Maybe ground them a little bit. Those are all really, really helpful tools. Um, so the next couple of slides are some of the content things that might be addressed in terms of education. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those. We talked about uh, body part education, private parts rules. We tend to encourage caregivers to use the language of okay or not okay or confusing touches versus good or bad touch. Um, probably so, all of us can probably think of a time when someone, you know, we knew a friend or family member or whatever gave us a hug that we didn't like. It was too tight, it hurt, um, it was kind of sloppy, we didn't like the perfume or whatever, or maybe it was your great aunt so-and-so, you know, and it was an okay touch, uh, or it was, excuse me, it was a, it was a um, not a threatening touch, for example, but it, it didn't feel okay, um, and it's, it's okay for children to have those boundaries set up, so usually that language is better for children than good versus bad, because some touches are also confusing. Um, 
Uh, for teens, um, uh, again, this isn't a teen presentation, but, some, but because they're in the home and sometimes it's the teen that has the problematic behavior, um, we need to make sure that they're in public places if they're with younger children. Um, they are never at any time put in charge of younger children for any period of time, never left to babysit. Uh, no sexually explicit material in the home, no matter who it belongs to. It's dads or grandpas or whomever, it doesn't matter. It does not need to be in the home. Anything that depicts sexual violence or deviant sexuality, uh, any kind of media content, all that needs to be gone. The whole family follows the modesty rules. Um, and then discuss those issues in a matter of fact way. And again, that's often hard for families to really uh, to address that. For teens who have significant problematic sexual behaviors, they may need some additional or different approaches. So some takeaways are trauma may be a risk factor for children who exhibit problematic sexual behavior. In fact, it frequently is. So it's important to identify trauma treatments if necessary. The child may need something like trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, for example. And that uh, problem sexual behavior in youth is not a risk factor becoming an adult sexual offender. Frequently are family issues and the need for education and supervision. So youth who have problematic sexual behaviors, if they receive appropriate supervision and treatment, have a very low risk of repeating those behaviors. And there are specific treatment programs and models um, for problematic sexual behavior. In fact, um, probably the best researched and the most widely disseminated one is the one developed at the University of Oklahoma's uh, Center on Child Abuse and Neglect. It's called Problematic Sexual Behavior, CPT. Again, the recidivism rates are like below 3%. So um, I want to mention a couple of resources very rapidly. Um, this is, there. Uh, interestingly, or surprisingly, there are no books for children who've exhibited problem behaviors. There are books for all kinds of other behaviors on children's part. There are no books for children who exhibited problem sexual behaviors. I'm a co-chair of the Problematic Sexual Behavior Work Group for the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. And uh, a couple of our uh, team members, Dr. Esther Deblinger uh, and Dr. Rachel Miller have collaborated on a text for a book. And uh, my daughter has done the illustrations for the book. The book will come out uh, later this year. It will be free uh, online, but it'll also be uh, available in um, paper versions. Uh, and when that comes about, you can find it on the National Child Traumatic Stress Network website. That link is up here on the top of the page. Um, two books that I would recommend are called Taking Action. You can find them on safersocietypress.org. Uh, if you, you can download a PDF of the book at no cost, but there's a $4 fee for the little paperback books. Um, two sites that I'll mention just quickly. The National Center on the Sexual Behavior of Youth. You can do no better than if you're dealing with family, um, sexual health, uh, sexual behavior problem issues. This website, ncsby.org, the National Center on the Sexual Behavior of Youth, has incredible information for families and for professionals. Part of that is an online newsletter for caregivers. Often caregivers feel very isolated uh, who, when they have children who have exhibited these behaviors. It's very hard to talk to a safe circle of support about this. Um, and uh, there's some great resources here for those caregivers. And then uh, lastly, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, it, they are sort of really the brought to you by. This whole presentation really has come about from collaboration and participation with the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. If you are not familiar with it, it is, a, it is the um, de facto um, uh, resource site, uh, bar none, for issues related to child trauma of any kind. And we have resource materials on the website for children with problematic sexual behavior. So I might invite you to look at that material. Okay. Um, uh, Gal and Christina, I think we're going to uh, maybe skip the video unless uh, we don't have very many questions. We could show this quick video um, if we don't have a lot of questions in the chat box. And I can't see those, so I'm going to have to rely on you guys for the Q&A. I think you can do stop sharing, and then you will be able to see all of us and, um, yeah, and the chat. And if we would like to show the video so you can uh, share it again. Okay. We'll see if there are questions before the video, and I could also just share the link. Okay, that would be great. Um, Christina, I saw there was a question at the beginning that I saw. I'm trying to find it. I don't remember. Yeah. And take a few seconds and please ask your questions. 
So there is a question about um, how would you address sexually acting out behaviors for a youth that has sexually abused as a child and has cognitive delays. It really has a lot to do with the level of the cognitive delays. There's actually some excellent research going on uh, uh, around the country around that. Uh, I have some colleagues that I believe that uh, one's at Mount Sinai in New York, and I can't remember where the other one practices, but they are using uh, models for problematic sexual behavior and for child trauma, specifically adapted for children with developmental uh, delays. So really essentially the process is slowed down, um, lots of repetition in the content material and in the teaching related. It's really crucial that caregivers are fully bought in and fully on board, but the children also really need a very good developmental evaluation to know what their strengths are as well as their deficits so that the, the, the training can be uh, really tailored to match their strengths. I know that's a very quick answer for really a very big question. Um, what are the ages in which it is considered developmentally appropriate? Um, it, it's, well, that's kind of a big question. It depends on the behavior um, because some behaviors for youth of any age would be considered inappropriate and illegal. Um, you know, um, and, and depending on the, the, really the big issue is the age difference between children. Um, we see a lot of cases, particularly in Oklahoma, and depending on the age of consent in a given state, uh, and the states vary in their age of consent uh, for teen behavior, um, but we look really at the difference in ages, and if it's youth about the same age, um, and you know, if you can evaluate consensuality there, then rarely is that looked at or adjudicated in a legal way, but if we're looking at a greater than age four-year range uh, difference between youth, that would be considered inappropriate, and youth could be at risk of being adjudicated depending on the age of the child. We've seen children charged with, with uh, sexual behavior as young as age six. That's crazy, I'll, I'll say right off the bat, but that happens unfortunately in some areas. So there are a lot of parameters and it dovetails a lot with legal aspects. Uh, judge Francine was on Monday. She used to be the presiding judge for the Juvenile Bureau and uh, presided over a lot of these cases. And the challenging pieces of looking at all the pieces and making the determination are, are, are quite, uh, quite amazing. Um, so uh, it's, it's a, I don't know if I've answered that question adequately, but it has a lot to do with the behavior and the age of the youth and um, you know, other factors. Um, gosh. Um, Did you see Ali's question, Roy? The one that said, um, why are all of our abuse prevention programs? Um, good question. <laughs> Why don't more of our abuse prevention programs? Unfortunately, we're still in an age where the majority of time a child who may have had an inappropriate uh, physical contact, sexual content, or experienced sexual abuse, over 90% of the time it's someone they know and trust already or someone in their own family. And unfortunately, we are still teaching um, I say we, many parts of uh, the child uh, education and prevention sort of focus is still kind of teaching stranger danger. That's less than 10% of the cases for children. So you're right, a lot of it has to do with the discomfort caregivers have. There is tons of material out there, so it's not a shortage of material. It may be that folks haven't taken a deliberate effort to search that stuff out, but there is some really, really good material there. I think largely it has to do with how uncomfortable parents are and they really don't, or caregivers, uh, and they really don't know how to approach this. And unfortunately, we've left a lot of things up to our school systems over the years. They feed our children, they educate them, um, they teach them social skills, um, all of those kinds of things. And in many cases, they're even giving them their medications during the day. Um, and a lot of parents sort of want to offload this to someone else to teach their children. It really is best done within the family and within their values. Most children, most adults didn't, weren't raised um, with the example of how to do that. So they have trouble replicating it. So I think that's a big part of it. Other questions that you see in the chat? I could scroll, I guess, a little bit. I think you got a rephrase from the question previous to the one you just answered. I, I guess, let me rephrase. When do children start showing curiosity about their and other people's bodies? Oh my gosh, it really depends on the individual child. Toddlers, not uncommon for child toddlers or even um, you know, very, very young children, 18 months, you know, 20 months, 24 months to have some curiosity about their bodies and be touching them. And then often just to find that that feels pleasurable. And that behavior becomes replicable. You know, if, if tugging your ear is, you know, oh, that's kind of, that's, I like that. You know, you might tend to do a lot of that or running our hands through our hair or whatever. 
So um, it, very early on that can start with children. And a lot of times how children will continue or not continue that behavior has a lot to do with the parent response. If they have that, oh my gosh, you're, you know, don't do that, don't touch your private parts, or you know, my toddler has an erection. You know, if the parent really has a, a, um, an overwhelming response to that, the child may have, you know, either feel like they've done something wrong or inadvertently a parent could reinforce something. Um, the best way to, to get kids to be curious, curious about something, you know, they always, you know, when you're sneaking bags into the closet, you know, right before Christmas, they may know to go looking for, for toys. It, the curiosity starts to rise. So if caregivers handle that in a very natural way and edu take that as an educational moment to teach um, and do it a developmentally appropriate way, that, that's often really the key for kids. Um, to be able to, to not feel dirty or ashamed, but to know that that curiosity is there and frequently uh, behavior, that even if it's re replicated, they'll often grow out of it or just, it'll just be taken up by other interests that are more social, more appropriate, and more, uh, more engaging. Um, Thank you for see. that, Roy. Do you sure. see that next question? I work with a 12-year-old who has perpetuated, perpetrated against his six-year-old sister multiple times has been in an outpatient program for over a year, but keeps reoffending. Do you recommend an inpatient facility in this case? Probably at that level. Um, I would, I would um, look at first, are they in an outpatient program that's treating that behavior? Um, because if, if they're not, and they're not using specific approaches, then it may not be effective. But if uh, despite some intervention and treatment and some structure on the families, it, it, you know, if all of those things are lining up, this child probably needs to be in a safer environment, at least for a period of time. And the challenge is finding, finding an environment that handles that in a way that really teaches some things rather than just isolating them and incarcerating them. Um, and that's unfortunately uh, the problem. We all, often don't have programs that are very comprehensive about addressing that. Um, but probably that child needs a supervised environment. Sometimes it can be done where the family is able to relocate that child maybe to another family member's home where there aren't, say, young children and providing additional structure. But that usually means it requires that you can have a very supportive family member who can do that. And of course, it's burdensome for them. So um, probably do need a, a structured environment. Unfortunately, Oklahoma does not have a lot of options. Many other states, I think, are better equipped than we are. Um, to provide a re an array, a continuum of services for youth with these problems. Oklahoma does not have a lot. Um, um, Candice, do you have your hand raised? If you have a question, you can open your mic and ask. Sorry, no, he had asked a question in the very beginning about raising your hand, so I just hit the raise hand. <laughs> Oh, okay, awesome. Just wanted to make sure if you had a question, you could ask it. <laughs> um, there was a, uh, something in the chat uh, there about what was the last site. Um, I'm not sure. I mentioned um, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which is a really a clearinghouse for all information related to child trauma. Every one of you, if you're in any mental health professional role on, on this call, you should know about and be very familiar with the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. It is that crucial. It is that critical. It is that good. The other two sites I mentioned were, were the National Center on the Sexual Behavior of Youth, NCSBY, National Center on the Sexual Behavior of Youth. Um, I think that's the only two I mentioned, uh, and just different pieces on both of those sites. Um, they have a lot. Uh, the NCSBY is specific to sexual behavior of youth. Um, another, if, if any of you are in a treatment role, the uh, ATSA, the uh, Association of Treatment uh, for Sexual uh, Abusers, uh, it does ha uh, skew more towards adult uh, offender treatment, but there is a lot of really good material on there now for uh, adolescent uh, sexual uh, behavior problems. And they've really retooled their thinking over the years to be moving away from sort of that f offender language to, you know, uh, treating it in, in kind of a proper frame for teens. So ATSA, A-T-S-A dot org, I believe is the site. Um, another site I might also mention would be the National Children's Alliance. You may be familiar with child advocacy, advocacy centers. They are the sites that have multidisciplinary teams. Usually if there's a concern about a child having been um, exposed to abuse and neglect, they're usually evaluated at a CAC, a child advocacy center. The National Children's Alliance is the parent organization for uh, child advocacy centers. And they have a lot of very good material around problematic sexual behavior in children. 
uh, collaborated with NCSBY folks and others to develop some resources there. So that would be another site I would look at if you're if you're working with that population. You know, we have a couple minutes. If there's not other questions, we could probably try to play that video. It's only two minutes long. Um, we want to give that a shot. Yeah. Can you see it? Are, are no, you, you able to see the video? No, you have to share your screen again and put it up. Ah, I have to go start that process again. So I have to go back to share screen and then go to the right. video. And click the bottom, the bottom about use the, the video, the audio. Is it there? Yes. Let's see if we hear it. Okay. This is a YouTube video. It's called Consent for Kids. It's a lovely little teaching video. Consent for Kids. This is you. Okay, it doesn't look exactly like you, but let's say it's you. This is your body, and you get to decide what you do with your body. No one else is entitled to tell you what to do with your body. Not your friends, not strangers, not adults you know. No one is entitled to decide what you do with your body, except you. That's called bodily autonomy, by the way. And that's what consent is all about. Everyone is different. Some people love to hug. And some people hate hugs. And each person gets to decide what they're comfortable with. Can a hug-loving person just start hugging someone at random? Nope. They need consent. How do people know if they have consent? They ask. Would you like a hug? Yes, I would. Can I hold your hand? I'd rather not. Okay. If a person doesn't say yes... Can I hug you? Um, I, uh... Then they haven't given their consent. It's really pretty simple. Ask for consent. Listen to the answer. By the way, if a person bribes someone or threatens someone to say yes, that's not consent. Sometimes adults will try to tell a kid what to do with their body. Go kiss Aunt Doris goodbye. But the kid still gets to decide. No thanks, that makes me uncomfortable. I'll just wave goodbye. Some things kids can't consent to. They can't enter into legal contracts. They can't vote. And they can't consent to sexual stuff, because they're kids. So if an adult does something that kids can't consent to, that's not okay. The adult is wrong, and it's not the kid's fault. And that's when it's most important to tell a trusted adult, like a teacher. Why? Because it's your body. And no one else is entitled to tell you what to do with it. Practice consent. Okay, isn't that a lovely little piece? Beautiful. <laughs> um, Beautiful. I Thank think, you. Uh, I, I, am, am I still sharing uh, the screen no. at this point, or you guys no, can no. see me? Okay. We can see you in. There's another version of that called Consent with T um, for slightly older kids or for, for young adults. Um, or adults in general, um, a caution if you go to look for that one on YouTube, because as people do, they've monkeyed around with that. And there's been some really sick ones kind of <laughs> fixed and posted on that. But if you can find the original one, it's a, a, a British uh, uh, accented uh, presenter. It's a, it's a lovely tool also for teaching, you know, teens or young adults, uh, middle schoolers probably about consent. And um, so there are a lot of good resources. Um, I know this has been kind of a, a lot of information sort of rapidly. I hope it's been useful. Uh, and if we have time for any other questions, if we're at time, I think. Um, basically, we need to, to end this meeting. And um, I will send them the link to this video because you sent it to me. So I will send you all. Um, thank you, Roy. Thank you very much. Uh, Christina is going to talk about CEUs. So while she's talking, you can take a moment and look at the chat for all these wonderful we'll that. comments that you got. Uh, it well, was thank a you. wonderful thank you for the opportunity. Wonderful presentation, very, very important. And thank you very much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, Gal, for the opportunity. Appreciate that. Thank you, Roy. 
um, for CEU, 